violence, speed, momentum. Those are the three words that I can best describe Warhammer 40k bolt gun. This game starts you off shredding those cinders to bits, and the game ends with you shredding those cinders to bits. They stand no chance against your chadly devotion to the Emperor. And with every heretic you exterminate, there is always one more to destroy. You know, I think 40k bolt gun has been the most fun I've had with gaming in a while, at least whenever it comes to a single player indie game. Boomer shooters aren't always my thing, but a good, fun boomer shooter is always something I can get behind though. The only experience I somewhat have of boomer shooters is the Doom remake and the Tarok remaster games that came out a while back ago. A 40k bolt gun is a blast to play through. And look, I'm just gonna come out and admit it, I know jack shit about the Warhammer 40k universe, so if you were hoping to maybe learn something about this game lore-wise from me confirming some conspiracy theory, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I would love to hear you talk lore to me in the comments. I always like learning lore from others who are very passionate about these things. It gives more emotional attachment value for me when I play something that I learn more lore about, but what I do want to talk about is the game itself. The game starts with these cutscenes of this lady telling you what your mission is as you crash land on the planet down below. The game starts you off with just a chain sword and goes through a basic tutorial showing you how combat works and all that jazz. Then near the end of the level, you get that chunky piece of sinner slaying metal called the bolt gun, which is what the game is named after. And my god, does the bolt gun sound so satisfying when you're shooting it. That chunky reciprocating bolt bouncing back and forth after each shot as you turn those ungodly cinders to gore bits. The game will slowly give you more weapons as you go through the missions and the chapters. There are three chapters in total for this game, and I recorded every mission individually and I ended up with 24 missions in total. So divide 24 by 3, and that's about how many missions are in each chapter. And each chapter ends with you fighting at least one or two bosses. But each mission pretty much starts and plays out the same. You go through the mission killing enemies, grab keys to progress, kill off enemies in a purging wave, then either end there or end with a boss fight. I will lie, it does kind of get a little exhausting after a while when each mission plays out the same, and the further you go into the game, the missions get more complicated in their layout and you will get lost sometimes. But what does sort of help alleviate that is how awesome the levels look and just how fun the game is to play, too. Pretty much all the levels relatively look the same, but that doesn't change the fact of how good they look still. And each chapter kind of has its own theme. The first chapter starts in the snowy mountains, then as you go through a castle, then going through these canyons, then the rest of the game goes through industrial areas and more castles. My favorite levels were the canyons and the castles, and the industrial levels were sort of my least favorite. None of those levels are bad, it's just that those types of levels in any type of game just relatively aren't my favorite to look at. But the industrial maps are very appropriate to the game, and they very well fit the industrialness of the 40k universe. But holy shit, the movement is so fun to mess around with. Whenever you start sprinting and time your bunny hops, probably one of the most satisfying movement systems I've ever had the pleasure of using in a video game. You can feel the heavy power armor as you sprint and jump around, hearing those thunderous foot stomps each time your feet hit the ground with each step and hop. Now, as I was talking about with the bolt gun earlier, the guns in this game are fun to use and very satisfying to shoot as well. As I mentioned about that chunky reciprocating bolt sound from the bolt gun, mm so good and the shotgun has that bang to it and the noise of the shells when you're reloading adds the extra chef's kiss to it and that zappy sizzling sound from the plasma rifle when you blast those sinners oh yeah and my god the heavy bolter is probably one of the most satisfying sounds i've ever heard from a gun and the laser guns sound so crisp and they sound like they're full of energy when you blast someone with them. And of course, the grenade launcher does sound pretty good too. And I mean, what can I say about the chain sword? It never gets old ripping apart those sinners with the chain sword. The only thing I wish the chain sword did though is like how in Doom, the chainsaw is mainly used to get back ammo and armor. And honestly, I wouldn't have minded if they made the chain sword a heavy hitting melee attack that would then go on a cooldown, but will reward you with health and armor. Because health and armor, or contempt, is what they call it, on the harder difficulties is pretty valuable, and most of the time you'll mainly get the big health and armor drops in the areas when you're about to fight a lot of enemies. It's not all the time, but on hard difficulty, there were times where I was thinking, man, 
Some health and armor would be great if these guys would drop some. But anyway, about the weapons again. There is not a single gun in this game that made me feel like it was useless or underpowered, and the chainsword always remains viable throughout the whole game. This game uses a strength level mechanic when it comes to the power of your weapons. Certain enemies and guns use a strength rating that goes through from 3 to 6. The first chapter starts your bolt gun and shotgun at strength rank 3, and moves up to 4 in I think chapter 2. And I think the game does that because the enemies get harder further into the chapters. But the reason the game uses this strength mechanic is because the enemies also have a strength level to them. I'm pretty sure the strength mechanic works in both ways in that the enemies are stronger at the higher rank, and the rank required from your weapon to deal a sufficient amount of damage to that enemy. The base enemies start at 3, then the bosses go up to 7, the highest rank, and the one rank above what your max strength weapon can be. And of course, level 7 being the bosses. Now, I played through this game on hard because I'm a Giga Gamer, and for the most part, hard difficulty for me wasn't too hard. The best way I can describe it as hard difficulty will make you strategically think about how you fight the tougher enemies, and the lower enemies don't really pose that much of a threat besides the plasma rifle ones. They may only be like level 3 or 4, but there have been a few times where I get hit by one of them and wonder where all my health is gone. Also, fuck the Chaos Chosen Warriors. I fucking hate these guys. And by hate, I don't mean that they're bad by design, but hate as in, you know, these guys will fuck you up. But the only bosses in this game that really gave me trouble were the Lords of Change, and of course, the final boss. But the final boss gave me trouble because he spawned in a Lord of Change for one of his phases during the fight. I don't know if this is a hot take or not, and feel free to disagree with me, but if you have to rely on your boss fight to be tough by that boss spawning in constant adds, then you have failed to make a good and fun boss to fight. And I'm sure that lore-wise, a Lord of Change is supposed to spawn an army to fight for them. And look, that's fine, but don't make it to where I'm fighting the adds more than I am the boss. And if you are going to have adds in a boss fight, add a purpose for that. Like for example, the sorcerer boss summons adds, but not in swarms. And his adds serve a purpose. The adds that he spawns in gives him a shield, and you have to kill the enemy to break his shield. Now if the enemies that spawned in dropped ammo, health, and armor like what they do in Doom, then fine. But the enemies you kill don't drop ammo, and the health and armor they do drop are these drops that give you two fucking points. And they only drop them in batches of like two or three. The health and armor you pick up, you'll just end up losing more of it if you get hit. And, of course, in my opinion, if you make a boss as to rely on adds without adding a mechanic or element to it, it shows that you lack the confidence in your boss to actually be a tough fight for the player. And sometimes, no boss is better than a bad boss. But even so, the lure of change may be an annoying boss to fight when you encounter him, it still isn't enough to ruin the game's experience. It's just more or less of a small blemish on the game, again, in my opinion. However, thankfully in some of these encounters, you get blessed with secrets you can use to help you fight in boss fights or in tough situations. Every level has several secrets. I tried finding all of them in my playthrough, but I'll admit these things can be hard to find, and I'm someone that likes to thoroughly look for these things. But the secrets in this game aren't like most secrets in other games. They aren't collectibles or hidden pieces of lore or information. All the secrets in this game are power-ups that you use for combat, and there are many variants. The cog wheel is a damage buff that goes on that specific weapon, so a strategy I recommend trying is applying the weapon buff to your strongest weapon. The buff lasts until the end of the level, so you don't have to worry about a time limit for the buff. Then there's the ammo upgrade you get for your bolt gun. There are two variants of this. There's one kind that makes your bolts look like magic missiles, then there's one that also makes them look like magic missiles, but they explode on impact. The other type of secret you can find is called a munitions boon. This will refill your ammo, and it'll give you extra ammo that fills up beyond what you can normally carry. But after you get past your base threshold, you won't be able to go back to where your munitions boon filled you up at. There's that one that looks like a crown type of thing, and quite honestly, I have no clue what it does. So if any of you know what it does, let me know. And my three favorite ones are the super damage buff, the super damage buff for your chainsword, 
and the infinite ammo slow time buff. Most of the time these buffs will be placed strategically around the map in areas where you'll encounter either large waves of enemies or near a boss fight. But be careful though, because this game definitely puts these secrets in cheeky spots. You might have to do some parkour to get to that secret. There was one that I found near the end of the game that was hidden behind a door they had to press E on to open, and when I found out about this, it made me wonder how many more secrets I may have missed. But once you get to that final level, you can tell shit is about to go down. You get max stacked health and armor at the start. Any weapon you may have missed or need ammo for, they give it to you right there. And once you step out from the elevator that raises you up, shit starts going down. As I said earlier, this boss definitely took a few tries for me to beat, but it's mainly because of this asshole. Tumulus, Tumulus, however you pronounce his name, he wasn't that difficult of a boss. He only really posed a problem when he had another boss on the battlefield giving him a shield. And look, I hate to repeat myself again, but this boss design makes sense, and it was really fun to fight until he summoned the goddamn Lord of Change. And fucking hell, I think I would've enjoyed this boss fight a lot more if he would've summoned a sorcerer alongside the big ogre you have to fight first at the start of the round. And well, I'm not going to repeat why, cause you already know why. Also, a couple more things I'd like to point out real quick. The idle animation your space marine does when you've been AFK is pretty neat and hella based. Nothing like reading your bible while you wait for your controller to come back to you. And a neat little feature this game has in the graphics options is that you can choose how retro you can make your game look. If you want to make it super pixely and have some more retro color palette to the game, you can. Or if you want to make it less pixely and make it look more modern, you can do that also. I just stuck with the default for the whole game because I felt the default style was what the main game was made with. But yeah, I think that does about it for this video. This game took me a week to beat, but that's not because the game is long. The game took me a total about 10 hours to beat, but balancing life stuff and hanging out with friends, it definitely takes time away I can make for videos, so that's why my sort of review came out a little later than others. However, I don't try and make hard reviews like others. I try to direct my videos in being more like an exploration as to why I liked a certain game. And I will be making many more of these in the future, so make sure to subscribe for more if you'd like to see that. But yeah, if you're looking for a good, fun game to play that'll give you a few hours of playtime, some bit of replay value if you care about getting all the secrets and beating all the difficulties, then I'd say the 20 US dollars are definitely worth your time and money, especially if you're a fan of boomer shooters and the 40k universe. But yeah, I'm gonna go and end it here. Make sure to like to help out with the algorithm, subscribe if you want to see more of my content in the future, and I shall see you when the next video drops.